open doors and do not find that air of permission. It has fled the world. Girls walk by me carrying their invisible bouquets from fields still steeped in grace. And I look up in the manner of one who follows with his eyes the passage of a hearse and remembers what pierces him. Um, the city of Reading was the up, young Updike's great metropolis. This is a scene from 1948 in Penn Square when Harry Truman spoke there. And as I noted earlier, for all its misery now, it was a vibrant, wide open town back then. Prostitution and rackets were rampant even when I got there in 1972. The city even had a socialist mayor in the 30s. Uh, curiously, in 1932, the year Updike was born, its population hit an all time high of 110,000. It's down to about uh, 80,000 now, I believe. It was a grand place, Updike recalled in that Paris Review interview. Thriving downtown, factories pouring out smoke, textiles and steel, pretzels and beer. It was a town that made things. It was a muscular, semi-tough kind of place. Now the downtown is a sort of empty, sad shell. And that was 40 years ago today, as I say, it's even emptier and sadder. Now, among the city's quirks, and one Updike described often in, in, in his fiction, is the pagoda. Um, a replica of a Japanese temple that was envisioned as a hotel and now sits incongruously atop Mount Penn. Luminous orange at night, the building looms like another moon over the downtown. In Rabbit Run, it is the Pinnacle Hotel. From there, a view of Brewer, Reading, spread out below like a carpet. A red city, where they paint wood, tin, even red bricks red. An orange rose, flower pot red. This is unlike the color of any other city in the world. Yet to the children of this county, it is the only color of cities, the color all cities are. Someone, I forget, who, want, who once pointed out that um, when he talks about, Updike talks about this flower pot color often, and the name of the character is Rabbit, that he somehow was indebted to the Peter Rabbit stories for, uh, for Rabbit Run. I, I never saw Updike deny that, so perhaps it was, who knows. But speaking of that thriving downtown, the Reading Burke's Historical Society has a photo in its collection, which is astounding. They were going through the photos of the collections of these photographers who used to take what they called people in the street photos. They would shoot your photo as you walk down the street and then attempt to sell it to you. And as they were going through the photos, they found one. And they said, wait a minute, that's John Updike with his mother walking down the street. And there he is in a rather garish shirt. I believe he was probably about 15 or 16 there. And then he, at that point on Penn Street, he was not far from Reading's Library, which of course was one of those, unlike was a grand old, one of the Andrew Carnegie libraries. I don't believe this was, this was library was funded by the Andrew Carnegie, but the one in Reading was, and it's more uh, utilitarian than, than this beautiful place. But it was a favorite haunt of Updike's, who would write of its cosmically mysterious balconies. Uh, he was proud of having read through uh, the two shelves of P.G. Woodhouse books it contained. And the library on Fifth Street, it happened to be located just off to the left there, was a great German bakery. And um, the boy would forever, Updike said he always connect the, the, the love of books with the smell of those great pastries and cakes coming from the bakery. It's a nice, when you think about it, that's a nice way to get it indoctrinated in the books. Yeah. Sometime not long before the chronological setting of in football season, which we heard about earlier, Updike had undergone the traumatic event of his life, the move from comfortable Shillington to the isolated farm of his mother's childhood a place just off Route 10, not far from the Morgantown Interchange of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, if you know where that is. There's the, the farmhouse as it looks today. Much looks in, uh, the, the, the new owners added that porch. It was just kind of a spare, small uh, German farmhouse when Updike lived there. We moved on Halloween day, I remember, he said in 1990. It had been my mother's birthplace. She thought that Shillington was sort of a small town, and small town people had small minds. The freedom of country space was important to her. My dear departed mother would have loved it if I had been able to see my way to come in here to the farm and carry on. There's a certain something a little oppressive about the places you grow up in. You love to have been there, you love to visit there, but to live here day in, day out would be too strange. I think a writer is a little strange for this part of the world, so as a favor to the place, I must sell it. He never could, however. Instead, he leased to a nearby farmer um, 30 acres of the, and sold the remaining uh, 50, not long after his mother died in 1989. His father had died of a heart attack in 1973. Anyway, what happened in 1945 was that the war boom had put a little money into the Updike's pocket. So when Mrs. Updike found that her childhood farm 
was up for sale, she snapped it up. And uh, I suspect her 13-year-old son, who was just then beginning to notice the girls of Shillington, was less than thrilled by the move, and in fact says so often in many of his stories. This strange distance, this less than ideal remove from my milieu, is for all I know the crucial detachment of my life, he wrote. The hero in his Pennsylvania work is always returning from hundreds of miles, finally. Aside from Rabbit Angstrom, perhaps the most memorable character in Updike's fiction is the recurring father figure, George Caldwell in The Centaur. That book was an homage to a man beaten down by life, but whose son never doubted that he loved him. And The Centaur, as I, as I think I said earlier, was, for those who haven't read it, is basically an account of three days in the life of George Caldwell and his son, Peter. And the story is interspersed with a parallel story about the mythical Greek centaur, Chiron. But that's irrelevant now. One of the features of the Caldwell portion is the daily drive that father and son make from the farm in Plowville to the school in Shillington. And you can, see, you can take that same drive today along Route 10 and see much the same things that, uh, that Updike saw. Um, there's, he describes some of the scenery that, that he sees along there. And then this is the barn in Pigeon Feathers where he, he was called on to shoot the pigeons and had that moment of existential wonder when he saw their feathers. That still stands and looks much, from what I understand, looks much the same as it did when he was a boy. And then there's Robeson Evangelical Lutheran Church, Plow Church as it's commonly called. His grandfather helped build its distinctive steeple and his parents and grandparents are buried in the adjacent cemetery. That's his parents' grave right there. And Updike's own children, when he died in January of uh, 09, had some of his ashes scattered uh, at the church there. And his daughter Elizabeth, he had, he had four children, they're all in their 50s now, uh, the youngest of whom Elizabeth said at the time that she, they scattered the ashes there because a part of him was always there. And he continues the, his description of that journey along Route 10. After the tiny town of Galilee, gathered no bigger than Firetown around the Seven Mile Tavern and the cinder block structure of Pottinger's store. The road, like a cat flattening its ears, went into a straightaway where my father always speeded. Now, I, now I would have written where my father always sped, but you know, what do I know? I'm not going to question uh, John Updike. But near the point where Route 10 joins with 724 and a left turn is required to meet Shillington uh, is Eberly Hill, deemed Cough Drop Hill in the novel. The hill was named for Isaac Eberly, a Reading hosiery mogul who built his estate there. Cough Drop Hill refers to another prominent Berks County entrepreneur, William Luden, who got rich making the cough drops that still bear his name. Updike once wrote about being shocked to find, as he roamed around Penn Station in Manhattan, a box of Luden's cough drop, never having imagined that anything from Reading could have attained such an exalted stature. But he had no idea that people would soon be saying the same of him. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the program. Hello. Um, my name is Taylor. Um, I'm, I just want to ask, uh, when did you start reading up Dyke's books, and which one of them is your favorite? I was in college when I started to read, uh, I was at Temple, by the way, and started to read Rabbit and Run because I heard it was about a basketball player and I was a sports fan, and, and it just sort of transported me from then. But I think, aside from The Centaur, I think my favorite Updike's work are the short stories. I think they're just brilliant. Um, just, just about any one. He had, he had such a, such a keen, as we said earlier, such a keen eye for observation and such a, such a wonderful sense of, of, of life that um, you can't help but be impressed reading the, reading the books. Even if, you, even if you don't understand what he's getting at, just to, just to read the words is, if you're anyone that at all loves uh, good writing, you, you can't help but be moved. Hi, my name is Patty. Um, I have sort of, I guess, a vaguely humorous question. When I was in middle school, I read Rabbit Redu, and I um, very happily recommended it to my mother. 
And well, I don't know. I guess she was somewhat scandalized by what she thought were salacious passages. So I was just wondering if he would, you know, think that was a funny story or if he would not think that was funny. No, he, he had a great sense of humor, and I think he would think that was funny. And he was often criticized for the salacious content of his uh, novels. He wrote vividly and openly about sex. Some would say humorously. I mean, there are people who say the worst writing that, that Updike has ever done is about you know, the sex scenes. Uh, but you're right, in Rabbit Reduct, there are, there are quite a few uh, vivid scenes that, that kind of live up to the late 1960s. Um, sexual freedom, um, I, but I think he would have. I think he would have been amused that your mother found it um, <laughs> kind of shocking, because he was a he was a fairly, in terms of writers, he was a fairly conservative guy. He was, you know, as we said, he lived in a small town. Um, you know, he certainly wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't a Norman Mailer or someone like that who had uh, kind of radical ideas. He was. He had a conservative mind and conservative temperament, and it always seemed unusual that someone like that would write so vividly about, about sex and sexual mores. Well, we have learned so much about John Updike and his work and about how Pennsylvania was a big part of his writing. Frank, before we wrap, any final thoughts for us? Yeah, you know, Tracy, I'm, I'm, I hope I live long enough to see how he eventually is assessed as a writer by, uh, by history because the, the fact that he you know, won several National Book Awards and several Pulitzer Prizes and and a lot of people believe he should have won a Nobel Prize. That doesn't often equate to lasting fame in literature. I, mean, I, I live in Westchester. Well, I, I lived a long time in Westchester. And there was a, a writer there from the 30s named Joseph Hergesheimer, extremely popular and, and you know, critically beloved author in the 30s who just has fallen out of favor. You, I, I'd be surprised if many people in here at all had heard of, have ever heard of Joseph Hergesheimer. And that's, that's a fate that befalls a lot of writers. And it, it works the opposite way, too. Fitzgerald was basically forgotten when he died in the 1940s and, and now, has, uh, you know, now is considered one of America's greatest writers. Uh, Fitzgerald, uh, uh, unlike Fitzgerald, though, Updike doesn't have any books. There really aren't a lot of Updike books read in, in high schools or in classrooms. Uh, so I think whereas people are still reading The Great Gatsby, there isn't, you know, as we said, the, the raciness of, of a lot of his novels and the, and the openness and the frankness prevents it from being read in high schools. And I think that's going to probably hurt him in terms of establishing a reputation over time as one of America's greatest writers. But I, I don't think anybody living today has any doubts about that. Well, Frank Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for teaching us about John Updike and his work. Thanks to our wonderful audience for their questions and their insights and their comments for Frank. And of course, a special thanks to our wonderful host, the Albright Memorial Library in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Remember that uh, Humanities on the Road is a joint venture between the Pennsylvania Humanities Council and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. And if you'd like some more information about our shows or what PHC is up to, you can go to the website, pahumanities.org, and you'll find all kinds of information about future shows and what the Humanities Council has been up to. So once again, special thanks to Frank Fitzpatrick. I'm Tracy Matisak. We'll see you next time.